Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the 170 congregations and 23,000 members of the Central Atlantic Conference of the United Church of Christ, I welcome you to this event honoring Everett Parker. Uh, this is an acutely important and special occasion to me for two reasons. One, before accepting a call to ministry, I worked for CBS for 15 years. And Everett Parker was very much a reason why I got to work at CBS for 15 years. So secondly, even after being an indirect beneficiary of his ministry, I actually got to meet Everett Parker. Uh, as he was a longtime member of Church in the Highlands, one of the churches that I was acquainted with in New York. And perhaps a huge honor was the fact that looking Everett Parker in the eye at 100 years old and him actually saying, I really liked your sermon today. <laughs> so I am so privileged to be a part of this occasion and welcome you to it. I ask that you join with me in an invocation, welcoming God's presence into our midst. Let us pray. God, who spoke the words, worlds into being and who still speaks with us today, we give you thanks for the long life and prolific witness of Everett Parker. We give you thanks for his passionate and relentless pursuit of fairness and justice, inclusion, that enables us to hear voices that otherwise would not be heard. For the blessing of his work that we receive every day, we are so grateful. We pray that our time together this morning continues Dr. Parker's crusade for justice and fairness in both traditional and non-traditional media. We pray for writers, producers, broadcasters, and journalists all who work in this field. We thank you for their creative skills and technical abilities, their persistence in seeking after truth. We ask that they have wisdom, integrity, insight, and judgment in the work that they do. May they be a voice for the powerless, a challenge to the powerful, bringers of knowledge and clarity to an uncertain and confused world. May they resist the temptation to follow the consensus, jump to easy conclusions, pander to prejudice, or cut corners of, on the truth. Help us who read, watch, listen, and contribute to media to play our part by being wise and discerning so that we will be both informed and enlightened by what we receive. And may we, in turn, inform and enlighten the world in which we live. We offer this prayer in the name of the one who brought the good news himself, who declared himself as the truth, and gave himself for a world in need, Jesus the Christ. And the people said, Amen. Thank you so much, Freeman, for getting us started at a moment of reflection. So this is an exciting year for OC Inc. because it's our 60th anniversary. It's amazing. Woo! Everett Parker founded OC Inc. in 1959, which was only two years after the United Church of Christ itself was formed. Um, it, and as many of you probably know, Everett was, uh, at the time, a nationally known expert on um, religion and media. And he had a meeting with Martin Luther King, as our origin story goes, and he asked what he could help to do with the civil rights movement. And Dr. King said, could you do something about the TV stations in the South? And as the saying goes, the rest was history. So OC Inc. has been on the forefront of working for media justice and communications rights ever since then. And today, we are happy to be surrounded. At the time, I think they talked about Everett Parker as being one of the founders of the media justice movement, but today, we are surrounded by so many organizations. This is like a vibrant sector, and it's really um, gratifying to 
uh, have so many colleagues and, and supporters. And so to mark our 60th year, we are launching a $60 for 60 years campaign, and we are hoping that for this campaign, 250 people join us. So we have cards uh, in the lobby, and we, of course, will also tell you how to get online. Um, and we're hoping that you will all support us for that campaign and in your own way be maybe a mini sponsor for this event. Um, but it would make a, really mean a great deal to me if um, everybody participated in that campaign. And there are also other people and organizations and companies that we need to thank for supporting this event and OC Inc.'s work throughout the year our generous sponsors. So hold your applause, but I'm going to announce the name of our sponsors. Our lead sponsor is uh, Comcast NBC Universal. We have two. And our second lead sponsor is Facebook. Our patrons this year are Charter Communications, Trackbone Wireless, and the United Church of Christ. And our corporate and nonprofit special friends are the Benton Institute for Broadband and Society, the law firm of Best Best and Krieger, and the law firm of Kelly Dry and Warren, and NCTA, the Internet and Television Association. Please join me in giving them a round of applause. And I also wanted to um, take this moment to acknowledge some special people in the room. But before we do that, I did want to take a moment, because I think many of us heard this morning that somebody has um, left our work here on Earth, and that's uh, Congressman Elijah Cummings uh, passed away this morning. And he was uh, served the city just north of us in Baltimore and was, as we all know, a tremendous leader of civil rights and justice uh, in his work. And so I just want to take a minute to remember Congressman Elijah Cummings. In addition to uh, thinking about somebody who has left us, we are glad to celebrate people who are still here. So I know we have two former FCC chairs, uh, Mignon Clyburn and Michael Copps are both here, and we welcome them. And um, we have our previous honorees and lecturers, and um, also our, we're really pleased to welcome all the staff from the FCC, Federal Communications Commission, and Capitol Hill. And, as well, we're giving out thank you. Uh, thank you to First Congregational United Church of Christ that it hosts us, Byron Adams, there's his, the staff here. And then last, but most definitely not least, uh, Colette Fozard is our meeting planner and she helps get everything together. So I just wanted to give them all also a thank you. So as I mentioned when I started, we're celebrating our 60th anniversary this year. And to celebrate, we thought we would look Go, look back and see what was happening, what else was happening in 1959. Hawaii, Hawaii and Alaska became our 49th and 50th states. Fidel Castro had just come to power in Cuba. Buddy Holly and Richie Valens were killed in a tragic plane crash. The microchip was invented, a little bit closer to home to this event, and Xerox began selling its first commercial photocopier. It's like, ooh, yeah, it was only two years after the United Church of Christ had been formed. It was a merger between the Congregational Christian Church and the Evangelical and Reformed Church. And the work that we undertake today, I think in some ways is uh, novel and something that Everett Parker couldn't have imagined, even though he only just left us a few years ago. But I think it's always uh, the importance would bring home to him. He was always a follower of the newest technology and understood the justice and the, and the structural issues that underlie all these questions. So I wanted to talk a little bit this morning about some of the things we have been doing this year. Um, since we last met, OC Inc. participated as a proud member of the Change the Terms Coalition which challenges all technology companies um, to protect people against hateful activities on their platforms. And our partners are many, and we're so thankful for them. Color of Change and Free Press, the Southern Poverty Law Center, the National Hispanic Media Coalition, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. And these groups came together and proposed carefully crafted model terms that target behaviors such as inciting or engaging in violence, intimidation, harassment, defamation against historically targeted groups. And there's also the terms ask for fair and useful um, and transparent due process. And we continue to work with companies to talk about these terms and to improve um, everybody's experience online for ourselves and for our democracy. In addition, this year, OC Inc. is starting a new project where we're working with faith partners and congregations to develop a code of ethics for those people and organizations to use on their own, on their own social media. 
and to think about these issues. And the second thing we, I wanted to talk about is media diversity. Uh, we won a great victory this year. We were able, in our lawsuit, we blocked the Federal Communications Commission from permitting massive consolidation in the broadcast industry. Also, again, everything is always done in partnership. And um, unfortunately, the Federal Communications Commission ignored the impact on the ownership by women and people of color. And the uh, U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit found that the analysis conducted, conducted by the FCC really wasn't even worth the most basic statistics class. And very important for us, the court also upheld standing. So OC Inc.'s history goes back to the beginning. We have that original UCC of the FCC cases established the legal right, the standing, for citizens to, to engage at the FCC at all. And that right has been under attack lately. And we won a really important victory in establishing that organizations do have standing, public interest organizations do have standing. Another great thing that happened this year in, ninth, in 2019 is that the UCC had its biennial general synod, which is our big annual meeting in Milwaukee, and we worked with local a local nonprofit to refurbish and repurpose computers for use in Milwaukee and around the world. I think that was the last slide. But on to prison phone justice, which is also a cause very close to my heart. Um, we're working to make sure that people have affordable communication uh, who are incarcerated, that their loved ones and families don't bear this unjust burden. And we have a piece of legislation that's bipartisan and led by Senator Tammy Duckworth. It's called the Martha Wright Just and Reasonable Communications Act. And we're really pleased this year um, that gentleman there with Senator Duckworth is Martha Wright's grandson and the person that really led her on her her way, so we're pleased to have this legislation in honor of Mrs. Wright, who did also already pass away, but who led a quest for just and reasonable phone rates. And we were super glad um, that John Oliver actually talked about the important issue of phone rates while we were, um, during this year, kind of raising the visibility. I always think it's, the companies don't want to see their names up there next to John Oliver and let's cut that cover. So we were kind of glad about that. Um, and then we're still working on making sure that Lifeline, the program that helps low-income people get affordable access to phone and internet, um, our faithful internet campaign is support of net neutrality, which we're gonna keep continuing to bring back and save the world for open internet. And this year, privacy legislation and so many other things. So we work in close, close, um, work with our friends in the civil rights community and the public interest community. It's a really, really valuable partnership. I'm really glad to see everybody here with whom we work. We um, appreciate everybody and whether we're negotiating in a boardroom, whether we're participating in a video conference, whether we're protesting outside, side by side, we appreciate your willingness to talk even when we don't agree. We appreciate that everybody here is doing their own part to try to make sure um, that everybody can, and every person in the U.S. can reap the benefits of modern communications technology. And now, on to some of the people who are really doing amazing work. I'm going to introduce Sarah Fitzgerald, who is going to present the McGannon Award. Thank you, Cheryl. Each year we ask our honorees if there are any elements they would like to include as we develop the program for the Parker Lecture. Sarah Macharia of the Global Media Monitoring Project suggested that we incorporate this very fitting reading. Last year, the Parliament of the World's Religions voted to adopt a Declaration for the Dignity and Human Rights of Women. It drew from a number of sources and was written in language that would apply to all faith traditions. It reads, being treated justly and with respect should not depend on whether one is male or female. The principle of treating others the same way one wishes to be treated is stated in one form or another throughout the religions of the world. We must all be treated with justice, respect, kindness, and love. It is impossible to imagine a God, a divine source, a sacred and ultimate reality that is unjust. There is no religion that despises women, for hatred and oppression cannot come from the heart of God or goddess or holy mother father, nor flow from that which is divine, the creator, the one, the source, the all. It is impossible to imagine the healthy, sustainable, just, and peaceful world of our collective future without the spiritual wisdom and leadership of women. 
OC Inc. presents the Donald H. McGannon Award in recognition of special contributions to advancing the role of women and persons of color in the media. Over the years, we have honored persons like broadcasting executive Don McGannon, as well as organizations who have done significant work toward achieving this goal. This year's honoree is the Global Media Monitoring Project of the World Association of Christian Communication. The project is the largest advocacy initiative in the world, seeking to improve the representation of women in the media. Every five years since 1995, it has conducted the largest longitudinal study of gender in the world's media, tracking such metrics as the numbers of women on the screen in bylines versus men, gender bias, and gender stereotyping in content. It involves participants ranging from grassroots observers to academic researchers to media practitioners, all of whom serve on a volunteer basis. Its next survey in 2020 is expected to involve volunteers in 130 countries. The survey is the longest running initiative of its kind. It is fitting that we celebrate this work because that is, after all, how OC Inc. got its start. When Everett Parker recruited volunteers to monitor whether television stations in the Deep South were truly covering all members of their local communities during the height of the Civil Rights Movement. Sarah Macharia serves as Global Coordinator of the Global Media Monitoring Project, as editor of its 2010 and 2015 reports, and as Gender and Communications Manager for the Christian Communication Association. Sarah also represents the association on the board of the Global Alliance on Media and Gender, organized by UNESCO. We are thrilled that she has traveled from Africa overnight, she says it's good she's traveling west because it's nighttime on her body clock, to be with us this morning to accept the McGannon Award on behalf of her organization. Please join me in welcoming Sarah Macharia. On behalf of the World Association for Christian Communication and the Global Media Monitoring Project Network in more than 120 countries around the world, thank you. It is an incredible honor to receive, not only to have been nominated, but to be the recipient of this year's Donald McGannon Award. Thank you to the Office of Communication of the United Church of Christ, and Cheryl especially for this recognition. I also thank all the sponsors and the partners who made this possible. To quote media scholar and GMMP pioneer, Margaret Gallagher, the GMMP is one of the most far-reaching collective enterprises of the global women's movement. The GMMP started as an idea, an idea almost 25 years ago to organize a single day global monitoring of the world news media to see where women were. The idea was not an idle curiosity. It came out of frustration of media's seeming neglect of women, their lack of respect for the dignity and integrity of women all over the world. This idea became the first global monitoring in 1995 in some 70 countries, and it has grown into the global movement for, media, uh, for gender equality in and through the media that it is now. Think of a stream that, brings, that becomes a, a river as tributaries merge into it, bringing life to the land through which it crosses. So it is with the GMMP, as more countries and more volunteers than we can count have joined in. The GMMP has created a global community of critical media audiences all over the world. It has amassed the largest body of statistical data on gender in the news media, data that is used as evidence to hold the news media accountable for observing industry ethics of fairness, accuracy, balance, and the basic tenets really of professionalism in journalism. This evidence has been used to lobby policymakers not to leave the media behind when they enact legislation on gender equality and women's rights. 
The GMMP is three things in one. It is a research project, it is an action network, and it is an activist movement. Thanks to the GMMP, we now know that out of every four people seen, heard, or read about in the mainstream news media globally, only one is a woman. Based on the trends, we forecast that it will take at least three quarters of a century to reach parity. We have learned that women have reported 37% of the news since 2005, and we are intrigued as to whether this is the global glass ceiling for women uh, in terms of their participation as reporters in the profession. Join us for the 2020 edition to find out. We know that the patterns of underrepresentation and misrepresentation of women have crossed over into online news del delivery platforms to the internet and to Twitter. We know that news media performance on gender equality is more or less identical the world over, whether in the USA, in Uruguay, or in Uganda. The empirical evidence reveals the sticky areas and points direction on where and how we should act. To quote Patricia Galicia from the team that has led the GMMP in Guatemala since 1995, the process has made it possible to raise awareness of journalists about the underrepresentation of women in the media. This group in Guatemala established the Mujeres al Aire Network as a space for women's radio practitioners to meet and learn about policy and program production. This group uses the media monitoring methodology to train university students to understand the media's role in reproducing racist and sexist practices and worldviews. The GMMP's network of volunteers is drawn from civil society, from faith groups, from universities, and even from the media industry itself. Visualize indigenous women's groups in Latin America, um, communication and journalism students and professors across Europe, journalists in the Middle East, feminist research networks in the Caribbean, and women's NGOs worldwide coming together for this single purpose. Right here in the USA, we have United Methodist women that were present when the GMMP was just an idea. And 20 years later, they are still leading the effort of data collection in the US. The GMMP movement stands for gender equality in and through the media. The network convenes for the global monitoring once every five years, returning back to their spaces equipped with enhanced skills and resources. They return back to civil society to share the knowledge and step up advocacy. They return back to academia to teach and enhance their research and back to media development spaces to help journalists discover the gender dimensions of their stories. To conclude, how many here watched Br Bridget Cosgay shatter the women's world record at the Chicago Marathon on Sunday? Or perhaps you did not notice it because you are still euphoric about Eliot Kipchoge's historic feat in Vienna as he pushed the limits of human endurance to complete a marathon in less than two hours. Many thoughts went through my mind as I watched him run especially during the last 500 meters. I could not help but reflect on the GMMP experience and the lessons. Anything is possible if you put your mind to it, if you put in place a plan, and if you determine to see it through. I am thankful for the allies, the families, the friends that have been our pace setters along the way. I am grateful for this award and its affirmation of the project the network, the movement. It inspires us not only to tire of mobilizing, not to, not to tire of mobilizing, not to tire of monitoring the media to gather the data that we need on media's gender blind spots, and to use the evidence to advance a journalistic culture of respect for the rights and dignity of women and all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Congratulations. My name is Hyo Jung Kim. I am a member of the OC Inc. board, 
And it is my honor to introduce the recipient of the 2019 Everett Parker Award. Each year we present the Parker Award to an individual whose work embodies the principles and values of the public interest in telecommunications and the media the way that our late founders did, founder did. Caden Mack is Executive Director of 18 Million Rising and is this year's recipient. In recognition of his work to create meeting places online for people of color with multiple identities. 18 Million Rising builds identity, belonging, and community power online in Asian American and Pacific Islander communities. Caden originally served as Chief Techn Technology Officer of 18 Million Rising and led the team that created Voter Vox, a tool designed to help local designed to help locate volunteer translation services for voters with limited proficiency in English. In addition, Caden was a co-founder of youngest.org, New York Students Rising, and an officer and staff organizer for the Communications Workers of America. Caden is such a great leader because he is able to merge his knowledge of technology and culture and to make profound impact on the world around him. Caden navigates online space and offline space and is someone that everyone just loves to be around. When someone is truly on the ground among their community and is able to imagine and wield technology in a, in a sophisticated way, it really shows. Caden is that person. I am honored to present Caden Mack with this year's Everett Parker Award. All right, uh, thank you, Reverend Kim. Um, and uh, before I get started, uh, thank you, um, to the United Church of Christ, OC Inc., um, for hosting um, and for this great award. Um, also, I would be remiss uh, not to thank uh, my team and our allies in the fight because while this is an award for me, none of my work happens by myself. Um, in particular, Laura Lee, our campaigner, is here today and she's been holding a lot of our um, uh, media justice policy work for the past several years. Um, uh, and the rest of my team is distributed across the country, so they couldn't be here today. Um, as Reverend Kim mentioned, I've, I've been at 18 Million Rising for a number of years, seven actually, um, which is wild to be a millennial and be at the same organization for seven years. Um, but for the past four or five years, I've been um, in executive leadership, and I mean, I don't need to be the first person to tell you that the past four years have been a trip. Um, but they've been a trip for me both uh, personally and professionally, right? Um, one of the things that uh, being called about this award has sort of led me to do is to really think about the past four or five years of our work, um, really starting with our advocacy for a free and open internet. Um, when we were founded, we were doing all of this online advocacy work and it had occurred to us in 2014 that it was necessary for us to engage um, with media policy, because if there was no free and open internet, could we even do our work? The answer is probably no. Um, since then, our efforts have expanded to include building and designing tools that are in principled partnership with our community, um, like VoterVox and an upcoming major project with Common Cause uh, to work on uh, community-based redistricting. Um, our growth from a scrappy startup to an anchor and really critical infrastructure in Asian American movements online has been driven not just by my vision, but really the vision of our, our team and our community. Um, nevertheless, uh, receiving this award really made me start thinking about the work that we have yet to do. Um, the story of my work in media justice is a really long one, and uh, when she called me about this award, Cheryl mentioned that she still goes back to this speech that I gave in Brooklyn, I think this was in 2014 even, um, where I talked about how the internet raised me. Um, and uh, 
Probably a lot of you have heard this story about how the internet saved my life, um, and I don't think I'm the only one who feels this way, right? Um, I grew up feeling really isolated and weird, and the internet was the first place that I found real belonging, um, found other people who were like me, and then also the guidance of like older, wiser, queer people who were like, it might not get better, but it does get different. Um, <laughs> And really, like, that story, that sort of foundational story, uh, has guided me back over the past several couple of years, two years or so, to thinking not just about the internet in terms of ideas, but the internet in terms of feelings. Something has been bothering me uh, really since the beginning of our last uh, election cycle, um, and really before, because it's with the rise of big social media companies whose business models rely heavily on our, our attention as the product that they sell to advertisers, the social web has honestly become a lot less social. Um, I worry that this is a symptom of really a bigger problem. As the world around us is reordered by money and technology that was not designed with the interests of community in mind, we find ourselves in a paradoxical isolation that both brings the world closer to us while keeping us neatly contained and alone. What does it mean to be rooted and in genuine relationship with others in a world like ours. Following these threads to understand how politics works on the internet has led me to think about the feeling of belonging. Before there's ideology, there is the search for the feeling of belonging. And ideology is how we make sense of the lack of belonging, right? And also of the path that we take towards community. The search for belonging, I think, is deeply and fundamentally human. Um, and it looks different across times and places, but at its core, what I think it is is an understanding that only in relation with one another uh, can we survive and thrive. My own search for belonging has led me here. Uh, if you know me, you know that I don't simply believe technology left to grow on its own will get us there. I believe that the work is really making sure that that technology serves the people. I believe that another internet, therefore, is possible. Uh, I believe that we can have one that is built, designed, owned, and stewarded by the people who use it and who rely on it to bring them their world. I believe that we can have an internet that's built on care, uh, principled struggle, and a vision of belonging that's expansive, not just expensive. As we turn toward the future, I know that we have our work cut out for us. We're called to use every tool at our disposal in what is ultimately a huge struggle against the rising tide of global fascism, and a climate apocalypse. No big deal. <laughs> However, I also know that so long as an us exists, and as long as uh, we will that us to exist, we have a shot at success. Uh, as once I was invited unsuspecting to imagine myself as part of an us that I didn't even know existed, let, let us invite one another into a movement to be an us, and to make the places our folks need both online and off. Thank you for this incredible honor, and I'm really proud to consider so many of you peers and comrades in the struggle. I could think of no better work to do with my life. Thank you so much. Congratulations, Caden. It's my honor to introduce this year's Parker Lecturer. Um, as soon as Reverend Julian de Chazier was suggested as a possible speaker for this morning, we knew that he was just the perfect, perfect person to give uh, the lecture. Um, then I found out that I had been in his church many, many, many times because uh, when I was at the University of Chicago, it was the center of many things, including many meetings on civil rights in Vietnam, and also the best, longest-running folk music site, um, I think, in Chicago, personally. And uh, I just discovered it's still going on. Reverend Gisazier, uh is the senior pastor at the University Church, pretty much on the University of Chicago campus. He is a minister, a social justice advocate and an artist whose innovative approach to, with, a, with an innovative approach to changing lives. Under the name of Jay K. West, he is an Emmy-winning hip-hop artist featured in the video Strange Fruit. 
He is also a faculty member at the McCormick Theological Seminary in the University of Chicago Divinity School, which we call the D School in Hyde Park. Uh, but before that, he was a graduate of Morehouse College in Atlanta. In 2018, he was recognized by the Center for American Progress as one of 10 faith leaders to watch, uh, and by Crane's Chicago Business as one of 40 leaders under 40 in the city. Julian was instrumental in establishing an adult trauma center on the south side of Chicago and currently serves on the University of Chicago Medicine Community Advisory Council. He's just joined the board of directors of Sojourners and is a regular contributor to that magazine, as well as the On Scripture HuffPost publications and others. He has appeared on ABC, Fox, NPR, and Dr. Maya, Maya Angelou's Oprah and Friends radio program. We are really eager to hear your unique perspective on the importance of music, media, social justice, and activism. So I present to you the 2019 Parker Lecturer, Reverend Julian Deschazes. Make sure you get the commemorator. Turn around. Oh, okay. Turn around. We're getting a picture. <laughs> awesome. No, <laughs> I want to thank you for that introduction, for this invitation to lead us all in a short discussion. To the honorees, congratulations. This is hardly nothing. Shout out to GMMP and Caden. I hope they see you coming. See the situation. See how people tell your story, how they quick to crush you. How so many in your shoes choose complaining. Look at how racist. Look at um, Trump. <laughs> that ain't doing nothing. See the world changing. I don't really know, but it's a new opening for us through communication to a new becoming. I remember feeling young and being displaced. How is this home being chased over fences running? Black boy on the ground over senseless nothing. Wherever I is, is Chicago making a different kind of statement. You looking at me like, would you please stop rapping so I can hear what he's saying? American way to reject another language. American angst, try to hear what I'm saying. I'm saying that day won't come until we make it. Beloved, I am so glad to be here this morning. I am so honored to be here with you all in this room with so many great minds and hearts all aligned toward upholding with integrity this critical and sacred vocation of storytelling. That is what links us all, journalists, writers, social media, savants, posters, preachers, producers. We are storytellers. And there's a proverb that comes from the Hopi people. Those who tell stories rule the world. Now coming up on the south side of Chicago, I would hear that differently, right? Telling stories meant something different. It, it, that was what you called lying telling stories, because as a child, you couldn't say that an adult was lying. Even if you knew they were, you had to say that they were telling stories. Some people are from a tradition of telling stories, and some people are storytellers, carriers of wisdom and power across generations. With, with the recent Washington Post story, I'm sure y'all saw it, indicating that President Trump has told over 13,000 lies in less than 1,000 days. That is prolific. <laughs> the Hopi proverb then becomes tragically ironic. Those who tell stories rule the world. What they knew what we know is the power of a story. 
Certainly in a room like this, it doesn't bear repeating. It's why my Morehouse brother prodded Dr. Everett Parker to do something about the coverage of the civil rights movement because the story was wrong. The story must be right, not only because we don't want to be accused of telling stories, but also once a thing has happened, it becomes a matter of the past. And the past, this is where I want to spend my time this morning, in this thing we call the past. And to do this, if there are any other multilingual people here, you will understand that the problem with English is that it flattens the meaning of words. It's, it's kind of a cultural violence, really, English, if you think about it, what it does to peoples and cultures across this world when we take their words and flatten them. Because in English, the past means back then. It happened. It is, it is disconnected from us. It is distinct, it's boring, it's a matter of record, it's a matter of history. The word we want to use as faith and communications folks is not past, but sankofa. Say that word, sankofa. It comes from the Akan people of Ghana as a parable. A young bird named Sankofa is raised in a village where she is loved and and held and praised and told that she can do anything. The world is in front of her and so she decides to leave her village. Let's go see this world, she says. And while she's out flying high, chest up, she runs into Big Bird. And the Big Bird is this big, menacing, big old thing. You, you can tell in a pack of birds who's in charge and it was clear to Sankofa that Big Bird was the one in charge. Big Bird saw Sankofa in her confidence flying and zooming past and said, you ugly. You know you ugly, right? You know you're not supposed to be flying this high up here with us. You know that, you know you're ugly and you shouldn't be flying this high, right? Go away. Big Bird insults her. Every time he sees her flying past, he insults her and reminds her of the same thing. You don't belong here. You are ugly until finally Sankofa regrets leaving and goes back to her village. Maybe Big Bird is right. Maybe I don't belong out here. She goes home and when she does, she connects again with these same folks who don't love her any less. In fact, they remind her again how much they love her, how much she can do anything, anything. They send her out again, but then they send her with directions. Don't forget us this time. Don't forget who you are. And newly confident, she goes back out, back toward her destiny, and now Big Bird is gone. The lesson becomes an African proverb. It is not taboo to go back and fetch that which you have forgotten. Or put it another way, you can't know where you're going unless you know where you've been. The proverb becomes a word, sankofa. And the word becomes an image, a bird with its feet facing forward, but its head turned backwards. To move forward rightly, one must always be looking backwards. That's what it means. The past directs the way forward. St. Kofa reminds us that the past and the future are tied together, but destiny is, is not only a matter of will and strength and deciding you want to do it, but knowing where you and your people have been. That, what, what that creates in us because of the past, an identity that is formed through the past, which means that the story must be told, it must be told well, and it must be told rightly. Sankofa is what reminds embattled people Forgotten people, disinherited people, who traverse a sky full of big birds. The big bird of xenophobia, the big bird of poverty, the big bird of corporatized education, of militarized peacekeeping. Big bird does not want you to have your story because with your story comes your identity and, and with an anchored sense of being no thing and no one can get in your way. Sankofa is our reminder 
that stories carry within them the power to make people and the power to remove them all together. The power of life and death. The problem with telling stories, lying then, is clear. Owning a story allows you to change people's destinies. This is why last names were changed for people entering America via the slave ship or via Ellis Island. This is why it was a crime for a black person to read 200 years ago, because they might learn the story. This is why that last name of mine that is so hard to pronounce cr traces back to a history that can only go back to 1863, but no further. Control the narrative of a people, and you will control those people. 18 Million Rising, the Global Media Monitoring Project, they understand that when you give a story back to your people, when you tell the people who are telling the story, we watching you. They c then those people come alive in ways that are beyond bone and sinew and flesh and fat and muscles and moles and places we didn't think moles should ever grow. Then, then those people get spirit. They get self-determination. They get what Dr. Milana Karanga called Kuji Chagalia. All this in a story about the past. In 1921, the black people of Tulsa, Oklahoma, had a district of businesses and markets and theaters and banks and hotels, self-sufficiency, independence. It was called Black Wall Street, a real thing with real people. It actually happened. And one of these people, a 19-year-old black shoeshine boy, goes into a building, they say to use the bathroom, enters an elevator where the operator is a 17-year-old white woman, them alone. The white woman leaves the elevator, files a complaint against the boy, and he gets arrested. He sits in jail. The Tulsa Tribune headline the next day, Negro nabbed for attacking girl in elevator. They use the word assault in the article. A lynch mob forms outside the jail, unable to lynch. They then, they then decide to attack every man, woman, and child who is not white, and they decide to burn down Black Wall Street. The police gave them weapons to do it. But the use of the word assault in the article is what riled everybody up when storytellers start telling stories. The Tulsa World reported a day later, in fact, if the facts as the police had been told had only been printed, I do not think there would have been any riot whatever. The lie, the lie in print that burned down Black Wall Street. The lie that killed Emmett Till. The lie that killed Trayvon Martin, Sandra Bland. The same Tulsa world, three days later, printed an editorial called Bad Niggers. When the story is told wrong, what happens to Sankofa? But when the story is not told at all, when the story is omitted, there's that book, uh, Lies Our Teachers Told Us. We need a book called Stories We Were Never Told at All. There are kids across this country who have never heard of Black Wall Street, including in Tulsa, where the, where the teaching the story is still not mandatory. You can do it if you want to, and most choose not to. Where after 98 years, the government of Tulsa finally decided to search for mass graves a few weeks ago. If you must tell the story, fine. If you insist, the status quo says, but a dangerous story is best left untold. The feet move forward in the same direction that the head is turned backwards. So when a story is told wrong, ah, now you see. But when a story is not told at all, Sankofa is impossible. The story of violence in urban cities tells us who is dying and who is killing, but not who is supplying and who is winning. Who profits from filled, filled jails? 
Who profits and who loses when this, not Black Wall Street, but this is the story of black men and women in America. My mama told me not to call nobody a liar, but the people who rule the world are telling stories. And it's a story that's killing us. How then do we respond when stories go missing? The curious case of the abduction of black identity and women's independence and migrant rights, all abduction cases that follow the same pattern of the most famous abduction case in human history. The one which, if we can solve, may help us solve all the rest. His name was Jesus. And he was born in Bethlehem, but raised in Nazareth. He was Jewish through and through. He made enemies by healing when he wasn't supposed to heal. By telling those that were cursed and considered cursed and damned by society that they were in fact beloved. He changed their stories without permission from the state-sponsored storytellers. He challenged the empire and was killed for sedition, noun, conduct or speech, inciting people to rebel against the authority of the state. That's what he was killed for. How is it an abduction, you ask, when somebody is already dead? Your brain is working this morning. You haven't even had 10 cups of coffee yet. Look at you. The abduction occurred centuries later when the center of a religion named after this man moved from Jerusalem to the capital of the most powerful empire that the world had known to that point. And in moving from Jerusalem to Rome, the story went missing. It was a theft when the religion of a Jewish prophet founded out of concerns for displaced Arab people was turned into a religion of triumphalism. It was a theft when Jesus died for our free freedom got turned into Jesus died for our sins. It was a theft when, as the theologian Kaseman said it best, the preaching of Jesus became preaching about Jesus, thus losing its entire content and its earthly content and completing the abduction. Jesus went from being Jerusalem's zealot to Rome's chaplain. Who benefits from the story being told this way? Who benefits when we talk about Jesus but never talk about what Jesus talked about? Then the people for whom J Jesus came, the ones in the margins, the, the oppressed ones, the ones with no options, the disinherited ones have no revolutionary fuel because it's not their story anymore. Then we can enslave them. Then we can control bodies in the name of family values. Then we can incarcerate anybody who doesn't, who, who doesn't look like us. They scare us because they don't look like this Jesus. Who you think came through bringing all them rifles? Same people came bringing all the Bibles. If you want to control a people, take their story, change their hero, and give it back to them, then the corrupted memory will wreak havoc inside those people, causing such chaos inside existentially that those inside will beg to lose their identity, to give the story back, to be like you, seeing no other course for their survival. But I thank God for the work of our ancestors, of Katie Cannon, of Gustavo Gutierrez, Howard Thurman, Oscar Romero, Dorothy Day, who noticed the inconsistencies of the story. Somebody here is lying and have worked not to recover the historical Jesus, but what James Cone called the scandalous gospel. Cone said the, the scandal is that the gospel means liberation, that this liberation comes for the poor and that it gives them the strength and courage to break the conditions of servitude. When the gospel is an artifact of the past as a matter of history, the gospel cannot do that. But when it is Sankofa, then, wherever we are, as writers or bloggers or pastors or rappers, we are keepers of a story gone missing. 
fact checkers of a story told wrongly. Storytellers in a world of people telling stories. You say to them, you may be in power now, but when my people get their story back, when we remember, remember, remember Sankofa, Miroslav Volf talks about the only way to break a cycle of oppression and suffering and violence is through memory. Sankofa, Elie Wiesel, without memory, there is no culture. Without memory, there would be no civilization, no society, no future. Sankofa, the, the Torah is a written record of what happened, recited and inscribed into the memory as a way of moving forward. Sankofa, in Joshua, now you can't come to church and not hear scripture, right? In Joshua, God says, look, Joshua, I know you're nervous, but that's because Moses was Moses and there will never be another Moses, but you are Joshua, and Moses didn't have a Moses to build on. You have a Moses who is your ancestor and a part of your story. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. We have been in this moment before. And then he says to him in chapter 3, verse 7, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Sankofa. What is our call? With all due respect to Sesame Street, it is to defy Big Bird. <laughs> what is our job? To be keepers of the story, to tell them, to tell them right, and to tell them well, to shine a light on abductors, to disallow that stories are only about what happened back then, to name that stories make people, to tell stories that remake the world, to empower people to tell their own story and not pretend that we have to do it for them, to know that people have within them, no matter how disinherited, the power to tell their story rightly and to tell it well, and we must empower them to do this. What is at stake? Life and death. This is why journalists are under attack right now. To cause your credibility to come into question and then question every story that you tell. It keeps the lie breathing. Big Bird sang, said to Sankofa, you know your story is fake news, right? But Sankofa wouldn't listen. Sankofa knew what was right. How could she listen to Big Bird with so much at stake? How could you not be weary right now? How could you not be upset? How could you not be angry? How could you not wanna, wanna write and attack everything? But, but please, for my sake, for my daughter's sake, please don't stop. You might think you're a blogger, a freelancer, a poster, a tweeter, a photographer, a publisher, a program director, a producer, a bureaucrat, a lawyer, a host, an intern. But never forget this. You are a storyteller. Those who tell stories rule the world. But God will see after the storytellers. God bless you and thank you. That is a hard act to follow. Uh, thank you, Julian, for bringing those words to us today and for your insight into the role that story can play in faithful social justice. My name is Cindy Bailey, and on behalf of the national staff members of the United Church of Christ, I want to thank you for joining us this morning to pay tribute to such worthy honorees Let's give them another round of applause. <laughs> I
I also know that the OC Inc. board would like me to remind you to pick up one of their $60 for 60 years commitment cards on your way out of the church this morning. We hope you've been inspired by our time together this morning. Let me tell you about three great loves, the United Church of Christ denomination-wide storytelling initiative to share with the world how we live out our call to love God with all our hearts, to love children, to love our neighbors, and to care, <coughs> excuse me, care for and love God's creation. Whether telling stories about knitting caps for newborns, taking actions on LGBTQ issues, or creating structures for caring for people with disabilities, all of our stories matter. All stories share how we, as a united church, are creating a just world for all. We invite you to enjoy the music that accompanies our video. This, our, we have a Three Great Loves theme song and hope you will leave here with a sense of hope for the future. N never stop telling stories for good. Renew your energy and your spirit to tell those stories and to collaborate to create a better world and a just world for all. Thank you for being here this morning, and thank you for um, putting this event together, Cheryl, Sarah, Colette, and... I'm probably forgetting other people, but thank you very much. I will sing of your love, 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 of your stay. Yes. Yeah. 